Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to take a break from the data updates I've been doing and talk a little bit about Tesla. Now, when I invest and do valuation, I know who my biggest enemy is, who's going to get me into trouble, and it's me. And it's with the priors and preconceptions that I bring into investing and decision making. And for me, no company captures that problem greater than Tesla, because Tesla, in a sense, is a company where there's no middle ground. On the one side, you have optimists who believe that this company is going to conquer the world. And on the other side, you have the pessimists who are convinced that this company is a scam game worth absolutely nothing. I've tried to have a middle ground and, and often failed because I've got abuse from both sides of the spectrum. And for the first few years that I valued Tesla, in fact, for much of its lifetime, when I valued Tesla, I took the point of view that it's a company with a lot of potential, but I felt it was priced too high. And when I did this, of course, I was accused by people who are optimists of being in the pay of short sellers and being too bearish on Tesla. Well, in June of 2019, I surprised myself and perhaps surprised many of those people by buying Tesla. I did it on the basis of evaluation and I did it at a time when the price for Tesla dropped to a point where I felt it was a good investment. Now the abuse came from the other side. People who were pessimists on Tesla felt I would bought into the hype. I don't think either side is quite correct, but I can understand where they're coming from. So that investment that I made in 180 is the one that I don't want to revisit in this session because much has happened between June of 2019, which was seven months ago, and January 29th, which was yesterday, at the time of the earnings report. In fact, I wrote this post and did this session right after Tesla put out its earnings report. So let's take a look at Tesla in June of 2019, which is when I bought it and when I did my last valuation. It was a dark time for Tesla. Tesla's stock price had dropped about 40%. The sky was full of dark clouds. You know, things didn't look good, good for the company. There were questions about whether it could grow, questions about whether it could make its debt payments. So with those questions in place, I did my first valuation of, te my valuation of Tesla in June of 2019. I adopted what I thought were fairly conservative assumptions, and you can make your own judgment on whether they're conservative or not, to arrive at a value of about 190 per share. Let me very quickly review the story I was telling for Tesla in June of 2019. It was a story of success still, success in terms of growing from being a company with about 22 billion in revenues to about 100 billion in revenues over the next 10 years, with margins improving to the 75th percentile of automobile companies, about 10% margins, and requiring a lot of reinvestment to get there. The reinvestment I computed by looking, by assuming that for every dollar of capital they invested, they'd get $2 in revenues. The value that I got was about $190. The stock was trading at $186 when I did the valuation. But while I was doing the valuation, some bad news came out. The stock dropped below $180 and I put in a limit buy that was executed at $180. I remember when I bought Tesla at $180, I was cautioned by old-time value investors that I wasn't giving myself enough margin for safety. After all, my value is $190, the stock is $180. That's not much of a margin. And my pushback was the margin of safety sometimes misses big issues. In the case of Tesla, I think the big issue that's missed by looking at that margin of safety is the tail of the distribution is on the upside. There are potentially far more positive surprises than negative surprises. So I was buying the tail and I felt at 180 I was getting a good bargain. Now I'll make a confession, when I bought the stock at 180, I didn't think it would turn around. In fact, I was convinced there was no more bad news coming. The momentum was all against it, but I got incredibly lucky. That's a word to describe it. This wasn't great timing. It wasn't some, some insight I had. I just got lucky because almost on my sell, the stock turned around and it went up and up and up. In fact, yesterday, just before the earnings report came out, the stock was trading at $581 from 180 to 581 in seven months, and I knew I had to revisit my valuation. So I took a look at what's happened since June of 2019 that might or might not explain the surge in the price. The first is those questions about growth have not quite gone away, but they've taken a backseat because it looks like Tesla is rediscovering some growth. Not the stratospheric growth that you saw four or five years ago, but decent enough growth that you can map out a plan for them to continue to grow. So there's a return to growth. 
The second, and this is, I think, one of the bigger changes of Tesla, is one of Tesla's problems through its entire life has been an inability to meet delivery deadlines and have a supply chain that actually works. And for the first time in its life, I thought Tesla turned its attention to operations. You saw production without drama. Remember that a couple of years ago when you had the drama of could they produce 5,000 cars a week or couldn't they? That was gone. They were, actually match they, were, they were actually delivering cars close to what they were promising. And they actually got the production plant that they were building in Shanghai online quicker than was expected. So you could see operating improvements. And finally, and I know this is going to sound small minded of me, but Elon Musk turned quiet during this period. You're saying, so what? Well, Elon Musk is both the company's biggest strength and its biggest weakness. Let's face it. There would be no Tesla without Elon Musk's vision and views about the future. But he's also an impediment to the company in terms of creating distractions. Tesla has a story stock and Elon Musk for a long time has been responsible for creating distractions in the story. Whether it's going after a diver in Thailand or talking about a different business model. So that relative silence from Musk, I think, helped the investors focus in on what Tesla's biggest strength is. There is still a core story that's a strong story. Now, there's one other issue with Tesla that I think is worth examining, which can explain why the value can move pretty dramatically. I've long argued that there are two different numbers in the market. There's the value that comes from cash flows, growth and risk from fundamentals and price that's set by demand and supply. And I've argued that those two mechanisms can yield very different numbers. In the case of Tesla, there's a feedback loop from price to value. Let me explain what I mean. First, remember Tesla has about $13 billion in debt. Now, that $13 billion in debt was there in June of 2019. It's still there in January 2020. But here's where the price, the stock price makes a difference. A chunk of that debt is convertible debt. And when the stock price rises, the debt becomes less onerous. In other words, as the stock price rises, the default risk at Tesla actually decreases. And this shows up in two places. One is as a, as a lower cost, lower default spread and cost of capital. And the second is in terms of the probability that they will fail. There was talk about failure in June of 2019 that they wouldn't be able to make, make their debt payments. That's kind of moved away because the stock price has gone up. The second feedback loop that occurs here, this is another positive, is Tesla is a company that will need to raise external capital to grow, even if you're an optimist, because to get from half a million cars or 400,000 cars to 2 million cars will require production. Production will need facilities to be built that will require capital. And if the stock price is higher, you need to issue fewer shares to raise the capital. So as prices rise, there's a positive feedback effect. There's one potential negative feedback effect. Tesla has a lot of options outstanding. A big chunk of those options actually were granted to Elon Musk by a board of directors that didn't know what they were doing, I think. There are 32 million options outstanding. You're saying, so what? As the stock price rises, the value drain from that options becomes greater. So there's a negative feedback effect. So I'm going to try to factor those in to revalue Tesla in January 2020. First, let's look at the base year numbers. In this table, I've compared what the base year numbers look like in January 2019 to January 20. No huge movements, and you shouldn't. There's been only seven months between those numbers and, and, three, and three earnings reports. The revenues have increased by about 9%. Not bad, but not as good as it used to be three years ago, four years ago, but clearly better than what some people were predicting in June of 2019. The operating margins have become less negative. In fact, in the last quarter, Tesla's operating margins actually turned positive. Nothing to write home about yet, but that plus makes a difference. And in terms of uh, cash and marketable securities, there's a big jump between June of 2019 to January 2020, again a factor that's going to reduce default risk. The number of shares pretty much stayed stagnant. And I should note that the January 20 numbers, I'm using the earnings release from yesterday, and those are not complete numbers yet. So I'll wait and revisit those numbers when the full, 10, when the full 10K gets filed go through the changes I made in my forecast because that's what's going to drive my value as of January 2020. First, I'm forecasting more revenues in the future. 
Now you can look at the growth rate, but the growth rate actually is a less is not as good an indicator as looking at the expected revenues I have ten years out. In June of 2019, that number was 102 billion in 10 years. Now I'm predicting 126 billion, close to 126 billion. What caused the change? Part of it is Tesla's growth, return to growth. Part of it is the struggles that traditional auto companies seem to be having, making inroads into the EV market. I've also improved my operating margin from 10% to 12%. That's a pretty strong move because 10% is already at the 75th percentile, now I'm making Tesla an even more profitable company with a 12% margin. I'm getting more optimistic in my story. On the sales to capital ratio, which measures how efficiently I'm investing, the long-term numbers have stayed around two, which is good for an automobile company. But for the next five years, <clears throat> I actually allow Tesla to grow with relatively little reinvestment. And here's why. According to the Tesla earnings release yesterday, they now have capacity to produce about 640,000 cars, which is well ahead of what they will need to produce for next year and perhaps even the year after. They're getting a little breathing room in terms of adding capacity because they've got ahead of the capacity they need. So to the extent that I trust Tesla, I'm allowing them to get $3 of revenues for every dollar of capital invested. There's been a drop in the cost of capital. Very little to do with Tesla, but more because of what's happened in the market. First, risk-free rates have decreased by about a half a percent. In addition, equity risk premiums have dropped from between June and now, and you can see that on my website. The overall effect is the cost to cap for Tesla as a company has decreased from what it was in 2019. One final change. In 2019, because of Tesla's troubles and the debt that they had seemed like something that could get them into serious trouble, I've lowered that probability of failure from 20% in June of 2019 to 10% now. Overall, I'm telling a much more optimistic story about Tesla, and not surprisingly, the value reflects it. The higher revenues help, the margins help, the lower cost of capital helps, but they all feed into a value per share of $427. Now, part of you is saying, can the intrinsic value change that much in seven months? We've been told intrinsic value is stable. You've been told wrong. The company like Tesla, intrinsic value can and should change. In fact, to show you where the change is coming from, here's what I did. I went back to my June 2019 value, which is $190 per share, and made one change at a time. First, I changed my base year numbers in terms of revenues and operating income. That caused an increase of about $24 per share. Then I lowered the cost of capital. That increases the value another $66 per share. The higher revenue growth increases another $58 per share. Improving the margin has the biggest oomph. It increases my value by $115 per share, accounts for 44% of the overall increase in value per share. Dropping the, value, the property of failure increases my value by about 28. Changing the net debt with the higher cash balance increases the value by about $20. And finally, the only negative here is because the stock price has gone up so much, those 32 million options outstanding are a bigger drain on value. The overall effect is an increase in value of about $250, $236 per share if you take into account the fact that you now have essentially all of these positive ingredients working on. So let what now? I'll make a confession. I went into this valuation hoping that I could continue to hold on to Tesla for at least a few more months. Two reasons. One is it's nice to have a winner. You, you like your winners in your portfolio. In fact, when a stock has done this well, you want to hold on for, for a little longer. The second is more pragmatic. I've held the stock for about seven months. If I sell now, those will be short-term capital gains, and at least in the U.S., I get taxed at an ordinary tax rate. If I can hold on for about five months more, it becomes long-term capital gains. Save me about 20% of my gains in taxes. That's a pretty substantial saving. Well, that might be what's driving the optimism in my numbers. So you're probably saying, why are your revenues so much higher? I, I, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say the good feeling in the market is not affecting my valuation. But even with those optimistic assumptions, the value per share that I got of $427, and I did this after close of trade yesterday, was lower than the closing price of 581 
And then when the, once the earnings report came out, the aftermarket price jumped to 650. I can't get there even with my optimistic assumptions. It is true that I could do some what ifs, right? I could raise the revenues to 200 billion, play with the margins, but the key word is play. Those numbers could are possible, but then then I don't think they're plausible or probable. It'd be game playing. And it's one reason why I don't like to do what if analysis. You're saying, well, don't I have to deal with uncertainty? There's a better way to do it. And you might have seen me do this in, in prior valuation. So I took Tesla and I did a simulation. I built it around four distributions, one for revenue growth, where I let the revenue growth vary from 15 to 35 percent, one on operating margins, where I essentially allowed for the margin to be different from 12 percent, lower and higher, one on the, the, the sales of capital in the first five years where you could disagree with me about how much they will need to reinvest, either on the optimistic side or the pessimistic side, and finally on the cost of capital. With those distributions put in, the, you see my value distribution for Tesla. Now, the way I use this value distribution is to look at those percentiles at the bottom. Now, remember at the, um, at the $650 stock price in the aftermarket trading, I'm close to the 90th percentile of my value. Could Tesla be worth more than 650? Yes, but it's not plausible or possible, at least according to my assumptions. So my decision, I, you know, I, 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 I would, as I said, my decision was delayed by the fact that I want to hold on. I did look at options. I said, maybe I can buy some put options to delay taking my capital gain. But options on Tesla are so incredibly expensive, given how much volatility is, is priced into them, that it's too expensive for me. So reluctantly, I am selling my Tesla. In fact, I sold it this morning at, to, at close to the open. I, I put in a limit sell at 640. It got you know, executed within 15 minutes of the option or uh, of the open. But my Tesla holding is gone. And um, I, I, as with my June 2019, in the near term, I don't expect the stock to drop. In fact, I expect it to keep going up. The momentum is good. The mood is, uh, is exuberant. It's going to, uh, so in the near term, the price will probably continue to go up. Perhaps I'm leaving money on the table, but I have no regrets. Now, as I describe it, I came to play the value game and I have to stay true to that game. If I now start to play momentum, I'm playing the pricing game. And frankly, I'm not very good at it. There are people who are much better at it. And finally, I, you know, I, I liked having Tesla in my portfolio for the obvious reason that it made money for me, but also because it's an exciting company. So I, I'm selling it with some, with, if I have regret, it's that it's leaving my portfolio, but here's the way I console myself. This isn't a permanent parting, it's a separation. And my view is that sooner or later, Tesla is going to be back in my portfolio because given how mood and momentum shifts in the stock, it can be undervalued six months from now. So, you no, know, watch out for my next update. Thank you for listening to me.